The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello and good afternoon, everyone. My name is Anna Zylik and I am with ICF. We are the vendor working on behalf of the sponsors of Energize Connecticut to bring these Passive House trainings to all of you. So thanks for joining us today. We will be recording this training and we will make this available afterwards. These trainings are at no cost thanks to the sponsors of Energize Connecticut and are part of a partnership with Connecticut Passive House. A quick reminder that as part of this training and workforce development initiative, we are offering a 50% cost reimbursement for individuals pursuing either FIAS or FEE professional accreditation. This includes the cost of the trainings and the exam, and once you become certified, we'll work with you to process the 50% cost reimbursement. So if you have any questions on that, please don't hesitate to contact us. Um, with that, I will pass it over to Keegan, who's also with ICF, to talk about the Passive House Building Incentives. Yeah, thanks, Anna, uh, Anna and hello, everyone. Um, thanks for joining us today. Uh, in addition to the no-cost educational training series and the professional accreditation reimbursements, the sponsors of Energize Connecticut also offer robust incentives for builders and developers who choose to pursue Passive House certification uh, in multifamily projects that have five units or more. Um, next slide, Scott. Thanks. The Passive House incentive design for Energize Connected is shown here on the slide. It includes pre-construction incentives for things like feasibility studies and energy modeling and post-construction incentives for full Passive House certification. Uh, our goal is for everyone involved in multifamily construction in the state of Connecticut to be aware of these incentives. Um, certification can also be done through FIAS or PHI. Uh, so for anyone interested in learning more, please visit the Energize Connecticut uh, website or contact us directly at the information listed here on the slide. Uh, and during today's session, uh, for questions, please feel free to use the chat function throughout, and Anna and I will relay them to Scott. Uh, and with that, I will turn it over to our uh, presenter today, uh, Scott Pusey. Hey, Scott. Thank you again. Thanks, Anna. Um, hi, everybody. We're going to talk about high performance ventilation today. Um, kind of emphasis on the high performance as we uh, get into things, but um, you know, really, it's going to be a lot about ventilation in general to begin with. So, sort of the principles of ventilation and air movement, and then talking about the various types of um, heat recovery ventilation, but also you know some of the other options that are out there. Um, we're going to talk about occupant and building issues relating from not doing ventilation well or, or improperly, and then also talk about, you know, what it looks like when it, when it is done well. So as with similar um, presentations and similar workshops that we've done, uh, this is now the part three, and um, we'll do parts one and two before our break. Take a break around yeah 2:53 o'clock, and we'll definitely wrap up by four. Um, and also, would like to know who is uh, on the call. Looks like we've got about 29, 30 folks uh, listening in today, and just wondering who is out there. Um, we're also going to be asking in the next slide something that you're hoping to learn about. Um, you can participate by using the poll EB. Uh, functionality that's listed at the top of the screen. We've got a couple more of these polls in the um, in the talk today. So if you want to take the opportunity to chime in now and later, it would be greatly appreciated. So we've got the contractor crew on on the call today. Thank you for responding. Always a good turnout from the consultants. Anybody else? Any anybody from the engineering design? Cool. Thank you. Oh, the designers have taken a strong lead in the poll. Great. Next question. Now that you're all warmed up, what's something you want to learn about today? It can be a one word, a couple words strung together. Use the underscore. It'll make a little more sense when it comes through on our responses. But um, just wondering what y'all are, you know, why did you join today? What do you want to know about? 
ERBs and HRBs, so energy recovery ventilators and heat recovery ventilators. Mini ERV splits, mini split, yeah, I think I know what you're talking about there. So different ventilation strategies, sizing, all right. Thank you for the participation, guys. This is fantastic. Locations, some savings potentials probably. Great. I think we are gonna cover almost all of that. Not sure how much we'll talk about sizing, but um, we'll see. Uh, all right, so we've talked about this um, during each of our, each of these workshops. Um, these are the reasons that um, we think Passive House is, is great. It's going to uh, have a lot of benefits, as you can see listed here. We're going to talk about healthy indoor air quality from ventilation systems uh, today and during the next part of this workshop. Speaking of which, you are on workshop number three, high performance ventilation systems for homes. Um, part one, we will have a part two to this. Um, and so just quickly going through the passive house pillars, the passive house principles. Um, it's a great way to do a high performance building. Um, the thermal insulation, the thermal bridge free, go hand in hand. We've talked about air tightness now, we've talked about the insulation, it's time to talk about the mechanical ventilation. This is what continuous insulation might look like. We use a blower door to test air tightness. And of course now, balanced ventilation and heat recovery. So kind of emphasis on the balance, emphasis on the heat recovery. Um, but as I said, we are gonna talk about a bunch of different things about ventilation. So beginning with the ventilation basics and um, indoor air quality, right? So um, sort of taking a step back, indoor air quality, is um, largely driven by these things listed. So the, the chemical substance of concern, you know, CO, carbon monoxide, um, not just from our heating and cooling, not just from our heating systems, but um, also stovetops, um, you know, cars, great source of carbon monoxide that can get introduced into the home uh, with EVs becoming more prevalent. That risk is going down a little bit, but um, you know, for the large majority of homes, all of these things are going to be a factor. Of course, radon is a little more regional here in the Northeast. We've got plenty of it. Um, VOCs, including formaldehyde and benzene. Um, so formaldehyde is, um, you know, being taken, it's not as prevalent in a lot of the building materials that we have these days, but uh, is still a concern. We'll talk about particulate matter 2.5, PM 2.5. We've talked about water quite a bit, and of course, bacteria and viruses. So um, these, this is from um, BASF, the, the graphic here, and um, a couple other programs sort of pick up on this, and they're not necessarily the ones that you might think of if you're sort of coming at it from a building science or sort of, you know, those programs that we all know and love, like Energy Star and that sort of thing lead. There's other programs that pick up on this as well. So um, HUD has healthy home principles, and um, you can see the link down there at uh, below, but, um, you know, these are the, the eight healthy home principles. You can see a lot of overlap with um, some of the stuff that we talk about quite a bit when you take a sort of energy star or green building kind of approach to, to keeping things out. Um, dry, clean, safe, um, safe in term, safe is a sort of a broad, broad category here, but um, I take it to mean sort of those combustion appliance things, the CO2, that sort of stuff um, in terms of what they're getting at with safe. Well ventilated. So we've got that in italics, right? This uh, list of things to do for a healthy home includes ventilation. And also here for foundations for health, 
uh, the foundation of a healthy building, a study done by Harvard. And so um, results of the high level results of the report are found here. You can check it out and Google uh, nine foundations for health.org and um, take a deeper dive. But as you can see on this one, you know, they're not necessarily listed in any order, but ventilation, of course, is a piece of it. Um, moisture, dust, pests, right? Like um, this stuff sort of just keeps coming up in uh, study after study. Thermal control is on here as well. If it gets too cold, there's gonna be problems. Um, lighting and views listed here, not so much in the healthy home principles. Um, so interesting safety and security is there too. I think that's well-deserved. Um, so those programs that are a little more familiar, at least to, to me as a consultant, being, you know, coming from green building and, and Energy Star side of things, um, these are sort of the, the programs that we know and love and the different things that they address. So as you move from left to right in the slide here, you can see, um, you know, Enterprise Green Communities does a pretty good job at addressing, you know, all of the things listed here. And uh, when you combine Energy Star and Indoor Air Plus, you can pick up on like the toxic materials and the radon as uh, things to take into account with the design and the build. Lead for Homes, um, sort of mirroring Enterprise Green or Enterprise Green mirror, mirroring Lead for Homes, I think is a better way to say it. The Well Building um, Certificate, same thing. And uh, Fit Well is another um, healthy building um healthy building program that's out there that does take safety and security into account so just interesting to see how these programs sort of stack up um for our part when we're when somebody when a client is asking about um indoor air quality uh especially we'll usually sort of double up on like one of the green programs either enterprise or lead and then also doing Energy Star to, to pick up the energy efficiency. So sometimes uh, overlapping programs are going to get you where you need to be. So what about um, things that are not related to ven ventilation and filtration? Because we're going to talk about ventilation and filtration. Uh, that's you know the topic of today's discussion. These things are those uh, is not ventilation and filtration, right? So the groundwater stuff, um, keeping water out of the structure. Talked about that a little bit uh, in the past with air barrier and some of the uh, insulation details, but um, it bears repeating. The combustion safety, um, so combustion safety, if there is combustion venting in, or if there is combustion appliances in the home, a lot of the programs are looking for it to be uh, sealed combustion. If you have any naturally drafting appliances, the, the need there is to do worst case depressurization, do some testing to make sure that it is drafting appropriately. Uh, of course, we're saying better yet, no combustion, right? Trying to shoot for that all electric design. Uh, keep pests out. So within the programs, there's different strategies to keep those pests out. Um, avoid or minimize the toxic materials. So um, Coatings and sealants definitely within Indoor Air Plus. Uh, those things get picked up in some of you know the lead requirements. Uh, with within lead, a lot of some of them are optional. Like you could get a point for um, for doing some of that, or you can. Some of them are sort of minimum rated features that you have to you have to do. And then smoking. Um, don't smoke at least indoors. That's uh, what Enterprise and Lead will will tell you. Um, or you can just not smoke at all, big risk factor, right? So why ventilate? Well, to get the contaminants out is the, the main answer. And um, why do we wanna do that? Well, efficient homes are more airtight. Uh, there's different materials, there's new pollutants. Um, these are all reasons to do ventilation and get, that contam get those contaminants 
out. So um, to sort of uh, just be very uh, specific about what we're talking about, we're not talking about combustion, venting, or makeup air, right? We're going to talk about the possible interactions between those, uh, between the ventilation and the combustion stuff. But when we talk about getting contaminants out under this context for this presentation, we're not talking about um, the combustion venting. Uh, we're talking about mostly, you know, exhaust ventilation and supply only ventilation or balanced ventilation. So, what sort of guides us uh, guides us as designers in uh, in terms of how to do this? ASHRAE 62.2. Uh, 622 is the one for um, dwelling units and homes. ASHRAE 621 uh, governs more of the commercial side of things. So, um, you know, offices, schools, that sort of stuff, laboratories. Uh, but 622 is what we use to achieve acceptable indoor air quality via dwelling unit ventilation or whole house ventilation. Um, it includes local demand controlled exhaust and source control. Um, and it also includes that whole unit uh, ventilation. So we'll talk more about that in a second. Um, so here's the definition of what ASHRAE talks about in terms of um, in terms of ventilation, the process of supplying air to or removing air from a space for the purposes of controlling contaminant levels, humidity, or temperature within the space. ASHRAE also talks about ventilation air as the minimum amount of outdoor air required for the purposes of controlling air contaminant levels in the buildings. Um, so definitions are important, sort of guides us in, um, in how we sort of think about these things. <coughs> so let's break this down. What does this mean for, uh, for us, for designers, for uh, builders? and consultants, um, basically two basic different kinds of ventilation, two basic ventilation areas. One is the dwelling unit ventilation. So this is also referred to as whole house ventilation, whole unit ventilation. It's ventilation that is intended to dilute unavoidable contaminant emissions. So um, think of this as a bath fan, right? We've got a bath fan pictured here. It is going to pull, um, it's going to pull air out of the structure, and so that air is being replaced by fresh air from the outside, right? Um, that's an example of dwelling unit ventilation. Usually, when dwelling unit ventilation is done with a bath fan, it's running 24-7. The fan is all always doing this, or it's coming on intermittently throughout the day um, so that it can sort of uh, continuously or periodically throughout the day provide this um, dilution. The other kind of ventilation also governed by 62.2 is this local exhaust. It's intended to remove contaminants from the specific rooms. So rooms like kitchens and bathrooms, um, some versions of passive house will have you uh, remove it from any laundry areas as well, but um, the idea here is that because of their design and function, they've got um, sources of contaminants, like known sources of contaminants that 62.2 is saying you need to provide, you know, at that local area, at that spot in the, in the uh, home, you need to have a ventilation source. So those are the basic ventilation areas. Um, here is a little bit more about local exhaust. So this is those spot areas, those rooms of concern, uh, the kitchen and the bathroom. This is an oversimplified um, summary of what 62.2 says. But basically, when you're talking about local exhaust, if it's going to come on with a switch, right, it's going to be intermittently operated. Um, it's not on a timer or anything, right? Like, or local exhaust in your bathroom, you turn on the switch, it needs to exhaust at least 50 CFM. If you're using a kitchen hood, um, microwave 
over the range microwave that's exhausted to the outside, right? And it comes on with the switch. It needs to achieve 100 CFM um, for a vented hood. Or you can do 300 CFM for a recirculation system. Again, this is way overly simplified, um, but these are, this is what's in 622. What about if that local exhaust system runs continuously? So these are still in the areas, these rooms of concern. What if you want to design a system that is continuously going to pull air out of the bathroom or the kitchen? For a bathroom, it's pretty easy. We wanna see that that is 20 CFM, it's operating all the time, but at a minimum, the flow rate is 20 cubic feet per minute. In the kitchen, um, it's a slightly different calculation. So five air changes per hour, and it's based on the kitchen volume. So you need to do a takeoff to figure out what the kitchen volume is. So for example, 150 square foot kitchen, I think that is probably with eight foot ceilings, if I had to guess, you're gonna need to provide about 100 CFM continuously. So uh, we're gonna talk about sort of the interaction between um, these local exhaust, this spot ventilation requirements, and what then you would do for um, your whole house ventilation. Because again, this is just your, your local exhaust right now. So for passive house- Scott, before you, before you move on, just a quick, um, quick clarifying question. Do you know um, what the state of Connecticut uses for ASHRAE, which version? I do not. No, that's a good question. Um, if I had to guess, it would be 2013. Uh, a lot of the programs are referencing 2013, but we would need to check that. Um, yeah, but good question. So in terms of passive house and what the rates are, um, you know, these are like typical rates, right? Passive house is, um, is looking to do their their ventilation through an ERV or an HRV, unbalanced ventilation is not um, is not allowed. So, in a kitchen, typically we're looking at 25 CFM continuous, and in the bathroom, 20 CFM continuous. So you might ask yourself, how does 62.2 sort of incorporate into passive house? And the answer is. Um, for passive house and 62.2, it might be pretty difficult to comply with both because of this kitchen conflict. Um, usually, if we're going to be exhausting, um, if you're going to be a, in like a single family home or a larger apartment where the kitchen is, is somewhat larger, um, usually, you know, those rates are going to be north of 100 CFM continuously. And so when you combine that with the bathrooms, and now you start to think about what your ventilation rate is, you know, for the dwelling unit, for the whole, for the whole building, um, you know, those rates can get a little high because that kitchen exhaust is high and it's continuous, which is why we've got this next slide to say, is it hard to do both? Yeah, it, it can be. And we'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, but in terms of the kitchen, in terms of the range hoods, we wanted to include in the presentation um, that we think it's important to ventilate the kitchen. There's a lot of stuff happening in the kitchen, especially in terms of cooking. Um, Range hoods should be should be ducted. Um, you know, it it all sort of like revolves around what the design is, and there's a couple different ways to sort of do this design. But when we're talking about range hoods, ducted or vented means no recirculation. Many range hoods are recirc and don't go to the outdoors. A lot of microwaves, you know, you can set to be recirculating, or you can, uh, you know, change the blower to to exhaust to the outside. So, in keeping up with this sort of like kind of a diversion away from uh, the whole house ventilation piece, uh, we wanted to include some range hood best practices. 
um, using the back burners is usually a more um, a better way to go because this the the range hood if it is you know vented to the outside it's going to be able to sort of get those pollutants uh, from the burners and anything that's being cooked on those back burners it's got uh, a better chance of getting sucked up and out of the home um, there's talk about having capture efficiency ratings for range hoods um, that's why it's talking about coming soon so capture efficiency sort of <clears throat> of the pollutants that are being given off by your cooking activities on the range below you, how, how effective, how efficient is the range hood at sort of capturing them and, and getting them vented outside. Um, quiet and efficient hoods are a great way to go simply because nobody likes a loud one when you're you know, in the kitchen cooking and um you know possibly trying to hear what other people are are talking to you about um so at the higher rates of exhaust some of these a lot of range hoods are very noisy and so trying to find something that's quiet is is a benefit as we see it because it's going to be used more often um in terms of considerations for range hoods that go outside that vent uh, these particulates outside there can be um, the need for makeup air sometimes so within the residential code anything over 400 cfm so if you've got a rated if your kitchen hood <clears throat> that's vented to the outside is uh, rated to to move more than 400 cfm of air um, you're going to need to do a makeup air system with it and uh, what we're finding on in some homes where um, you know you've got a very tight enclosure and even if you have a kitchen hood that is less than 400 cfm you still might need makeup air um, we've got that on the next slide but sort of the anatomy of what a makeup air system might look like you know you've got your range hood here it's going to the outside um, and then the makeup system here could be something that is a vent to the outside, right through the wall. Um, there's going to be uh, a duct, there's going to be a motorized damper, and maybe it's a ceiling register that, um, you know, when the exhaust fan for the range hood is turned on, the motorized damper opens and it acts as a relief to bring that makeup air in um, and keep the pressure in the in the um in the space you know kind of balanced or you know you're you're bringing this outside air it's being brought in it's being driven by the exhaust fan right there's no other um there's no other fan in this system except for the exhaust fan. so here's an example of um a house that it's not like all that tight, um, but it, it was a retrofit home and um, it was pursuing lead for homes. And so they had a, um, a fireplace, a wood burning fireplace in the home. So we needed to do makeup air, to, we needed to do this worst case of pressurization testing, right? And so um, before any makeup air was added, when everything was turned on, the range hood, the bath exhaust, the dryer. Um, it was a negative 11 Pascal inside uh, the home. And so with this fireplace, we're saying that's sort of a, a non-starter, right? You don't want to have a negative 11 Pascal pressure difference when, you're, when you have a wood, wood burning fireplace. So what was done, a six inch duct with the damper was added, and you can see that is, here underneath the stove. The stove actually sort of rolls back and kind of slides on top of this duct. Um, it has the damper, it's wired to the range hood. So when the range hood comes on, damper opens and that worst case depressurization. So the range hood's on, the bath exhaust is on, the dryer's on, um, was reduced to just three pascals of pressure uh, from inside to outside. So, if there's any questions uh, about what we're talking about here, um, 
now would be a great time to, to type them in. Uh, I know not everybody deals with makeup air or the need for makeup air. It's kind of something we, you know, maybe doesn't come up all that often, but um, I, I hope this example sort of illustrates what we're trying to talk about. Yeah, Scott, there's uh, there's one question related to flow rate on bath fans um, that, yep. that asks, is the flow rate on a bath fan of 50 CFM intermittent, uh, as in the fan rating on the box, or is it a measured CFM through the flow hood? So to comply with 62.2, the design needs to um, accommodate that, right? So you've got to have a duct and a fan that are capable of exhausting, you know, in theory, 50 CFM. So um, you just want to make sure the static pressure that the design was done under is like achievable with what gets installed, i.e., you know, the duct is sufficiently large enough. Usually for a bathroom, that's a, you know, six inch or four inch round sheet metal duct, and then a fan that is able to um, push that air through that duct at the distance that it needs to go. So you need to take into account things like um, elbows, the length of the run, right? All of this stuff is usually is referred to as the total effective length. <clears throat> and so there's calculations in there to come up with that total effective length, and then you want to make sure that the bathroom fan can do that. For to comply with 62.2 in terms of the programs, so if you're going for Energy Star, LEED, um, any of these programs, for sure you have to demonstrate with performance testing that it actually can exhaust that, that it is actually exhausting it. Um, in terms of complying with 62.2, I'm not sure if, you, if commissioning, you know, if that performance testing is part of the standard or not. But within, you know, Energy Star, it's going to direct you, you know, you've got to measure how much air is moving through. You have to commission this system and, um, and document that it is moving that amount of air. So I think, I hope that answers the question. Yeah, and, and one other question for now. Um, uh, do you temper the outside air um, on, on intake? So for the makeup air system, probably? Yes, for, yep. Yep. Um, well, usually not, not in the systems that I've seen. Uh, the strategy for this one was to have it come underneath the very warm stove um, as sort of a kind of poor man's tempering. I've seen this on passive house projects as well, <clears throat> that this is kind of the, the gist of it. You want to have that air, um, you know, the makeup air coming in close to the heat source, i.e. the stove or range or whatever that is kind of like triggering the need to have makeup air, have that damper open in the first place. Um, I suppose in very cold climates, you know, some kind of duct heater or something like that, um, you know, you might get into that kind of consideration for the design, but um, at least in our neck of the woods, climate zone five or uh, even six, um, I, this strategy is what we see most often. Um, okay, so common approaches for a non-passive house project. This is pretty typically what you know you might see in a non-passive house uh, project. The bath fans are going to be Energy Star certified. Kitchen hoods, hopefully, are Energy Star certified. Um, I, you know, because the sound levels are, are good. So along with that Energy Star certification for a kitchen range, you're going to get, <clears throat> they do measure the sound in decibels. And of course, for bath fans, a little more common, uh, I think most of us know that um, they're going to, as part of that spec, to earn the Energy Star for a bath fan itself, they've got to have a sound level that is less than one zone. They're also going to be tested for static pressure and flow, um, which is a huge deal. It sort of goes to the point uh, that the other question was about, um, you know, does the system actually have to perform? Um, well, when you buy an Energy Star rated uh, 
piece of equipment, you can see those static pressures and you can see those flow, the corresponding flow rates for them. So generally, if you have a design that is using the correct static pressure and you install the ductwork to sort of match that design, i.e. you're not going to put in a bunch of elbows that wasn't in the design, that wasn't account accounted for in the static pressure and flow rate calculation, um, then you're going to have, you know, you're going to achieve your flow rate. Now, it's not guaranteed. We see that, um, you know, on the outside of the house where the duct, you know, leaves the home and there's that, you know, flapper, the, that damper can get stuck, I'd say probably, I don't know, 20% of the systems we test, that flapper is either painted shut, silicone shut, like something is causing it to be shut. We've seen birds nests sometimes in there, right? Like any, and a lot of stuff can happen in the field, but um, you know, that's not part of the design. That's sort of just, um, you know, construction issues or, you know, in the case of the bird, you know, it, you just want to be able to, you want to test it at the end. That's why testing is such a great thing to, to see. Um, but yeah, for these approaches, for these non, for the, you know, sort of typical approach, this is kind of our, our recommendations. Um, variable speed's great. Um, other controls for bath fans include uh, timers, relative humidity sensors, um, trying to find a piece of equipment that's less than 15 watts <clears throat> is a good idea, uh, and you'll be able to see what that rating is on the Energy Star certified stuff. In terms of the kitchen hoods, um, that capture efficiency um, may be coming soon. It's sort of you know being talked about within the industry but certainly not required and uh, not a thing yet. And then maybe automatic controls, <clears throat> um, automatic controls for the kitchen range to turn on when it senses that cooking is happening could maybe potentially be a thing. Okay. Um, in terms of dwelling unit ventilation, so we talked a lot about uh, just now about sort of the, the local exhaust, the spot areas that we need to do these things, i.e. bath bands and kitchen hoods. But at the top of uh, when we started talking about all this, we also said there's requirements for full unit ventilation, dwelling unit ventilation. So this is the, um, this, the ventilation that's going to dilute these other um, contaminants that are in our buildings. So it's from people's materials, background processes. So, um, you know, other things, background processes are other stuff that people do in their homes that are creating uh, poor indoor air quality. Um, you know, I don't know, like model airplanes, right? The glue that is used or um, just stuff that is going to put these pollutants into the into the space that are you know not necessarily happening in kitchens and bathrooms. Uh, the need for this whole unit ventilation is needed to to dilute these um, these contaminants. Okay, um, so there's a couple different types of whole house ventilation. Uh, we're going to talk about three of them, the three basic types. We're going to talk about the pros and cons and hopefully address the code requirements, the program requirements, and then best practices. So let's get on with it. Exhaust only. Exhaust only is moving air from the inside to the outside, <clears throat> and that's it. So we just got done talking about a whole bunch of different exhaust strategies. Um, and so in the context of this whole house ventilation, you have the option to do an exhaust only strategy that is, um, you know, that ventilation system is usually running all the time or it's running periodically throughout the day on a timer, but it is pulling air out. Second common one is supply only. It's sort of the same thing as exhaust only in terms of it's running 24 seven or it's running intermittently automatically on kind of like a timer control, but it's pushing air in, it's bringing um, outside air into the structure. So 
and exhaust only. The space is uh, negatively pressurized with reference to outside. With supply only, your house is positively pressurized with reference to outside. And then the third one is balanced, which um, is the passive house preferred, uh, sort of you know the high performance uh, version of this. And so you're doing both supply and exhaust at the same time. So it's referred to as balanced because the space inside you know your home is uh, neither positively nor negatively pressurized with reference to the outside. At least that's the idea. Okay, so I've been talking a lot. I am curious what types of ventilation systems <clears throat> you all typically see on your projects. Um, as I said, we see a lot of exhaust only. Cool. So balanced supply and exhaust is winning, which is shocking right now, at least to me. Got 38, 38 or so folks on the call. Really, you guys see mostly balanced supply and exhaust? All right, there's more exhaust only. I may not turn this poll off until I'm proven correct, I'm not sure. Well, uh, all right, so now it's even. Anybody else wanna weigh in and push exhaust only over? No, all right, it's 50-50, we're gonna, you guys, we have some advanced designs out there. Um, all right, so we'll talk about these in order. So exhaust only first. Um, so this is going to use usually an efficient bath fan running continuously or on a timer, as I've said. Um, so this is a smart controller. This is another version of a smart controller. Looks like maybe we've got some programmability in there. Um, and then of course the bath fan itself. Major concern with exhaust only. <clears throat> Where does the makeup air come from? Well, it comes from somewhere. Um, when you combine exhaust only with combustion appliances, there's a possibility for backdrafting. Um, it can, again, so talking about where does the air come from in exhaust only, it could potentially come from crawl spaces and basements. It could exacerbate potential radon concerns. If you've got an attached garage, right, you're negatively pressurizing uh, the home. And so it could potentially bring um, bring that, that air uh, from, you know, an attached garage into the home, sort of drive it in there, or maybe a neighbor's apartment or the condo, right? It, it's all just getting at this, well, you know, the space is negatively pressurized with reference to um, to outside or with reference to a different zone of the of the structure, i.e. the crawl space, garage, your neighbor. Um, so one of the pros of exhaust only is that it is super simple. Um, it's really pretty straightforward in terms of an easy installation. It's low cost, it's low maintenance, Usually it's pretty low power as well. Most fans, well, best fans are, you know, six to 12 watts when they're exhausting. Um, you know, Panasonic does a nice job with this. You know, a lot of uh, green heck fans, um, you know, there's a lot of fans listed on the Energy Star uh, website that are going to do this exhaust only ventilation uh, with a very low uh, wattage cons are where's that makeup air coming from, right? So um, your basement, your crawl space, wherever, it's the answer. <clears throat> the answer to the makeup air is it's coming from the uh, path of least resistance. Um, and so we just don't always know where that path of least resistance is. In a passive house, um, you know, we've taken a lot of care to seal up the enclosure. And so, um, you know, where is that makeup air coming from? Uh, it's still coming through the enclosure the, somewhere, or it's coming, you know, from an attached garage potentially. Um, you know, there's just a, a lot less availability of that makeup air to actually, you know, be, be, be brought into the space. Um, 
Another con of exhaust only is the distribution and mixing of that fresh air, right? So you're sucking on sucking on the on the home, pulling that air out. And um, you know, that fresh outside air is going to come through that path of least resistance. Is it necessarily going to make it to the people who need the fresh air, i.e., the humans living in there? It's anybody's guess. Um, you know, it's not an intentional system in terms of distributing this fresh air to really where it needs to go, right? Like the building doesn't need fresh air. The occupants need this fresh air, this ventilation. Um, so what does exhaust only look like in practice, in execution? Um, you want to assess any risks. This is in terms of like, you know, what your design might um, take into account. Um, if there's any existing systems, you want to evaluate those. Um, so you want to know what the flow rates are. You want to know what the static pressures are. You want to know, you know, where the outlet is going. Is it going to, you want it to have terminate outdoors and you want to have an efficient um, ECM product. So an efficient fan that is going to make all of this run. And any duck runs are as short and as straight as possible slash practical. So again, to this, um, thought that you know you can have a fan that says on the box it's rated to 50 or 80 CFM but that rating is done at a specific static pressure that static pressure is based on a length of duct and um, how many bends are going to be in it so uh, having it be straight uh, is preferable also with exhaust only we want to commission it um, we find uh, ventilation, ventilation flow rates are sort of the uh, second biggest reason that um, you know you, we've got issues on the on the buildings that we test. Um, followed, well, <laughs> I might have to take that back. Ventilation is quickly becoming the biggest issue that we see on a lot of our projects in terms of getting the flow rates right. <clears throat> Um, you know, blower door testing and getting that infiltration down. In passive house, it's difficult and it's tricky and it's, um, you know, you've got to really be intentional about it. But on uh, like an energy star job or, you know, even just a code uh, level uh, of air tightness is, is usually pretty achievable. Um, but, you know, the flow rates for ventilation continue to be, you um, continue to be tricky you know every project it seems like there is an issue um, it's usually a fixable issue but it's an issue that we find nonetheless um, what about you all um, I know that we said it was sort of 50 50 on whether you're looking whether you're seeing exhaust system exhaust only systems or uh, ERV HRVs but wondering what issues you're seeing with exhaust only systems, not only during the construction process, but is there anything that's sort of like causing a warranty issue that you have had come up um, with exhaust only? An imbalance, okay. So I wonder if that is meant by sort of its the exhaust only is an imbalanced um, design by design, and uh, that's what's causing the the problems. All right, so somebody else has seen backdrafting a fireplace. It's not just that one project that we had. That was actually a SWA employee, a Stephen Winter Associates employee's home that had that um, makeup air thing going on. All right. Um, thanks for sharing. Uh, let's move on to supply only ventilation. Keegan, if there were any questions about exhaust only, now would be a great time. But um, we can yeah, talk about caught up on questions. Yeah, caught up on questions at the moment, but I'll, you know. Okay. So supply only. Uh, supply only, remember, is pushing air into the building, into the dwelling unit. Um, Usually it's integrated with a central furnace, an air conditioner, an air handler, you know, something is usually, um, you know, ducted to that air handler. 
um, and it's usually integrated with um, you know that supply fan. So this central fan integrated supply, abbreviated CFIS, is the most typical thing that we see for supply only. Um, we usually see this happening with the booster fan, though, um, not necessarily through the air handler. So what we mean there is. Um, well, I think our next slide is going to talk about this. Oh, it's just the advantages. All right, so I'm going to go back here because I have a diagram. Um, so what we see typically is that this outside air duct is going to go into the return side of the air handler. And so in a traditional central fan integrated supply, um, you know, the thought was that, well, when the air handler turns on, and there's a negative pressure created in the return duct, it's also going to pull the outside air and, and bring it in. And uh, what we're saying is that what we usually see is that on this outside air duct, um, that we usually need to see it with a like an inline fan, a, a booster fan, right? So uh, the advantage is there is that we now can um, have a more reliable flow rate and uh, we know that we're going to at least meet the minimum. And if it's got any speed control on it or dampers on it, we can, you know, make adjustments to it and get it uh, to where, you know, the flow rate that we need to be at based on the size of the building, the number of, bit, the number of people living there, all that stuff is also governed by ASHRAE. So the booster fan. What are some of the advantages of this? Um, you can get some pretty decent distribution. It's not great distribution. Um, and this <clears throat> good distribution of the fresh air, that's to say, is only when the air handler is running. Um, when the air handler is not running, that air is just being brought into, you know, the return duct usually. And um, a lot of times, you know, we'll, I was just in an apartment last week where we had this kind of set up and, um, you know, when the air handler wasn't running, that fresh air fan um, was, was still running and, um, you know, the air was just sort of like falling out of the um, return duct, right? The return duct was just in the hallway. Uh, so that, that ventilation air, that outside air was not being you know delivered to bedrooms or living rooms or you know kind of where people tend to hang out um at least i don't hang out in my hallways all that often but um you know it was a very well ventilated corridor in this uh, or hallway you know in this apartment that i was in so anyway it's also got relatively low cost it's got low maintenance um some of the disadvantages are that um the electricity use of an air handler can be quite high. Uh, newer equipment is better, but um, you know, if you were trying to use sort of the traditional um, uh, supply only, you know, working this into your um, air handler, usually, you know, the air handler would have to run to get it, you know, distributed. And so there's systems out there that you can tell the air handler to run intermittently throughout the day in order to ventilate, in order to provide the ventilation to the space that 62.2 requires. Well, if you don't have that booster fan, you're using the air handler fan. You're using the biggest fan in the house to make that um, system happen, to make that ventilation happen. And so um, it can be quite the energy penalty when you're, when you're doing it that way. So using that smaller booster fan to get the air um, brought into the home is a little a little better uh, technique. And um, there's also the potential for duct leakage losses. <clears throat> so here's another diagram of what you know this system might look like. Um, and so this is without a booster fan. It's just using this air handler, right? Uh, fresh air brought in. Here's the control that's tied to the air handler. Uh, typically, this control is going to tell the air handler to turn on and open the damper periodically throughout the day. There's smart controls out there <laughs> that are going to integrate into the air handler where, you know, if the air handler is running because it's hot outside and air conditioning, you know, needs to happen, um, you know, it's going to do a calculation to sort of 
reduce how often the air handler would run without a call for cooling. Um, so there's that smart controller that's available. Um, but in terms of duct leakage, um, you know, you've got the, the duct leakage losses, like if you have leaky ducts, you're not gonna really get this air distributed to where it wants to go, um, you know, that fresh air. So what does this look like sort of <clears throat> implemented? Um, here's some tips on, on trying to do it well. Only use with an efficient per, uh, fan furnace <clears throat> or with this sort of booster fan uh, setup. You're gonna have to have uh, tight ducts, which you know even code is requiring pretty tight ducts these days. <clears throat> so that's kind of, uh, can check that one off. A motorized damper that is wired correctly um, in, in this case, uh, this motorized damper in this design was not wired correctly. It was wired backwards so that when the air handler was on, it closed to the damper as opposed to we wanted the air handler to turn on in this damper to open to let that fresh air in, uh, right? It was wired backwards. Um, and then locate this outside air intake properly. So properly is meaning above the snow line, right? So probably at least two feet off the ground. And if it's coming up, coming from a roof, uh, you know, you want that intake to be two feet above the roof deck. You want it to be away from other exhaust sources. Uh, this is another code thing as well, but you know, you don't want to be bringing the fresh air for the home. You don't want to have that intake located next to like the dryer or located next to your kitchen range exhaust, right? That defeats the purpose. You're just recirculating <coughs> that uh, very moist air or polluted air or both uh, right back into the home. Um, this one was on a, a nice patio. Um, I think when we were out there doing this testing, you know, they had, there was a nice grill that was set up right here. So, you know, uh, trying to keep it away from other sources of contaminants. Um, other things to keep in mind with this sort of setup is to check the manufacturer data of the air handler to know how much outdoor air you can bring in at, you know, at, at a given out, outdoor temperature. So this is reading that at 10 degrees Fahrenheit when it's outside, you know, 10 degrees, you only want to bring in 17% of the air that the air handler is moving. So um, that you want to be aware of that, um, of that kind of information before you go ahead and implement this kind of system so that um, you can bring in the right amount and select the right air handler uh, to make this work. Okay, so we're gonna talk now about balanced ventilation. Um, this first uh, first slide, well, it is, it is three o'clock. Why don't we go ahead and take our break right now uh, before we move into balanced ventilation. I'm gonna go fly, find my, oh man, we've got quite a few slides before the actual break. Where is it? There it is, here it is. So we're gonna do a five minute break. Um, Unless there's any questions, Keegan, before we hop into it, um, but it is three o'clock and I'll just go back to the balanced ventilation spot. We'll be back at uh, 3.05. Yep, sounds good, Scott, thanks.
Okay, so picking up on balanced ventilation. We talked about supply, we talked about exhaust. Uh, so we're talking about balanced ventilation in terms of um, mostly you know, the whole house, um, how to get this balanced ventilation. So uh, another way to do it is to, or one way to do balanced ventilation is without heat recovery. And so that is not a lot of extra controls because usually the, um, that central fan integrated system, you know, that controller has the ability to not only open the damper uh, on your outside air duct, but it can also run the air handler and it can also <clears throat> tell the bath fan to exhaust. And so we're counting this as a balanced system. There's no heat recovery, but it is, it is balanced. We're keeping that pressure difference um, across the enclosure you know, neutral, i.e. balanced. Um, it's got similar concerns as the other uh, centrally fan, central fan integrated systems, um, you know, that supply only stuff. And so the question is, can we do something that's a little better? And uh, spoiler alert, the answer is yes. Um, what is an energy recovery ventilator? So it's an ERV that is sort of preconditioning outdoor air using exhausted indoor air. And so the magic here is within the core of the ERV. In most residential ERVs or HRVs, this core is what we call a flat plate core. In larger buildings, um, you know, there's there might be a wheel, uh, something that actually spins to sort of like get the heat recovery to happen. <clears throat> there are some residential ventilators that use a a, um, a wheel as well, but the majority are flat plate. And so doing this preconditioning, doing this energy recovery um, helps recover some of the energy already used to condition the air in the space, which is now being exhausted, right? So it's, um, it's not, it, it's swapping this, these airstreams don't actually mix, but the energy um, of the airstream is what is transferred. And so here is some more, you know, cutaways and sort of like how this happens. Um, here you can see this this wheel that I was that I was talking about, but um, you know some systems have it, and uh, this is more of a flat plate sort of thing, right? So um, again, these airstreams do not meet, right? So you can see the core here. This is all blue. This is all fresh outdoor air. It is moving across the core in in sort of like you know one direction and then the warm air is moving across the core in another but it's a different part of the core right and so let's say that it is uh, colder outside than it is inside so heat moves from hot to cold right and so the temperature difference across these across the material across the core there is a temperature difference and so the energy embodied in that air in the warm indoor air it's going to transfer it's going to it's going to move across the core um, to the to the other stream again the streams do not mix they do not meet they're separated from each other but the energy does transfer what are some benefits of these you get heat recovery it's balanced ventilation usually it can be distributed fresh air not always, there's a couple different designs, and you have a known source of this outdoor air. Some disadvantages, uh, they're still kind of pricey. Uh, costs have come down. Uh, there's additional maintenance that goes on with this, i.e. changing the filters, uh, and there can be integration issues. We're gonna talk about design considerations, but that's what we mean by integration issues. Uh, we want to share with you what we've seen, you know, what works, what doesn't, and what you might be able to take back uh, and incorporate into your own practice. So other types of systems that are not um, ERVs, HRVs, we had actually a request from one of the uh, 
past listeners to talk about this. So um, other systems include, uh, you know, commercially known, there's a Minot Minotaur, Minotaur system. There's also the CERV uh, smart ventilation. And so this, uh, with both of these systems, um, it's sort of like, you know, your ventilation, your heating and your cooling in one box. And so um, it's in both the Minotaur and the CERV, it is actually heat pump energy recovery. So within these systems, as I understand it, as we understand it, there is no core. It is not an energy recovery uh, thing that's going on here. Um, and this, this next bullet is taken right from CER, CERV's website. Instead of an ERV or exchanger core, the unit uses high efficient heat pump to exchange energy between incoming supply and outgoing exhaust air. So the incoming and outgoing exhaust air here um, is the ventilation, is the ventilation air, but you're, you know, you're using some of the waste heat of the heat pump process in order to uh, make this happen. But it's important to note that it's not, you know, a straight up ERV. You're not, you don't, you're not approaching kind of those efficiencies. Um, in terms of using it for passive house projects, <clears throat> um, for, for PHI, for Passive House Institute, sort of the more international version of the program, the one that um, is used, you know, in Germany, it comes from Germany, et cetera. Uh, these types of systems are not yet um, able to be, you know, modeled. Um, PHI is looking for some, some more performance criteria out of them. As we understand it, FIAS, uh, Passive House Institute US, it does allow at least the Minotaur system. Um, and we know of one project, it's not our project, um, that another uh, consultant had used the Minotaur system on. So um, we don't have any any sort of like performance data on it, but um, you know, it is an option. In looking at the websites for CERV and Minotaur, the thing that I notice is uh, Minotaur does boast uh, compliance with ASHRAE 62.2. CERV <coughs> um, does not say anything about compliance with 62.2 per se. It does talk a lot about sort of the demand controls. So uh, there's sensors and things involved with that system that are going to um, detect, you know, higher levels of CO2, I believe, higher levels of VOC, uh, those sensors are going to detect it and it's going to activate the ventilation system or run that ventilation system with more outdoor air. Um, and so while that's not explicitly compliance with 62.2, at least not that I know, um, you know, it, I think there's probably some benefits to, to using that demand side technology. Um, those demand controls are used pretty often in commercial applications, especially <clears throat> in terms of what uh, those systems detecting amounts of CO2 and turning on or ramping up, that sort of thing. So, um, you know, there might be something there um, in terms of having that, you know, move into the residential, into our homes and apartments. Um, but the big takeaway here, not an ERV, not an HRV, um, and, you know, you just need to look into this technology and see if it's right for your for your design. Again, for FIAS, um, where it is that we've heard uh, the Minotaur system was, you know, FIAS allowed that to, to happen in a, I think it was a multifamily building. All right, ERV, HRV. So a heat recovery ventilator, um, an HRV is going to transfer sensible heat only. So it's just the temperature, it's the heat that you can sense. An energy recovery ventilator, an ERV, is going to transfer sensible heat, but it's also gonna transfer latent heat in uh, the form of humidity. So moisture is always gonna move from high to low, um, just like we said about heat moving from warmer to colder, moisture is gonna go from a high concentration to a low concentration. Um, and the same is going to be, you know, it's gonna happen across the, <clears throat> that ERV core. So ERVs transfer moisture, but they are not dehumidifiers. <clears throat> we hear, I hear uh, this quite a bit, um, you know, even within the industry that, you know, an ERV is a dehumidifier, it's not. 
um, what an ERV is going to do, and there's some, it, you know, it can reduce moisture of incoming ventilation air, but it all depends on which air is more humid, right? Um, so during summer operation, you've got hot, humid outside air, and um, the return air is cool and dry. And so as that hot outside air is being brought across the core, it may transfer to <clears throat> the return air that is cool and dry because your return air from the space, you know, from your apartment, from your house, has been conditioned by your air conditioner. And then, you know, it's going to take some of that, it's going to transfer some of that humidity from the outside air and it's going to transfer it outside. Um, sorry, that was the bottom here is the HRV summer operation. The ERV summer operation is, is the same, i.e. there can be transfer. Sorry, I messed that up. This, this bottom part is the HRV summer operation. You can see the hot, humid air is just coming right along for the ride, right on inside. With the ERV summer operation, if the, if the inside air is cool and dry and the outside air is hot and humid, a portion of that, in, of that outside air, the humidity in there could potentially you know, be redirected outside. Only if the return, only if your inside air is cool, is drier than the outside air. So that's the caveat. That's why on the next animation, it says it depends. Okay. I hope that that was not clear as mud. I hope it was somewhat clear. If anybody has questions, we can go back to it and talk through it. Um, okay, let's talk about some system layouts and some options for the ERV, HRV. Um, you could integrate it with exhaust air from the bathrooms and the kitchens. <clears throat> you could integrate it with a central duct system. Um, that's what this, uh, these photos are, are depicting. Let's see this sort of in, in a layout that's a little easier for us to um, talk about. E slash HRVs with central air handlers. Um, so you can see the ERV and the H, the ERV or the HRV, whatever your recovery ventilator is, um, you know, both the stale air going out of the building and the fresh air coming into the building are in this example tied to the return side of the air handler. We're telling you don't do this. Um, don't do this because. Um, it's going to sort of short cycle, right? Um, if you're pushing the outside air in to relatively the same space that you're pulling inside air out, you probably are gonna pull a large portion of your fresh outdoor air, um, you know, right through and back out the building, um, which we don't wanna do. We want that fresh air to <clears throat> make, our, make its way into the space. So, and into the occupants, right? So how can we do that a little better? Um, here is a slight change to trying to hook this ERV, HRV up to the air handler return side. <coughs> um, what you could do instead is um, have the supply air going to either the supply air of the air handler or sometimes you can have it to the return air of the, of the air handler as well. But in this case, you're going uh, fresh outside air to supply air of the air handler and being distributed through the heating and cooling ductwork to the spaces in the home. While at the same time, you're bringing um, the return air, you're exhausting that, that's your, your supply of um, stale stale indoor air being brought out of the building. That's an option that you could do. Um, we don't think this is a very good idea either um, because usually this ERV, HRV is not gonna be able to overcome the two and a half inches, uh, or sorry, the, they're only rated for two and a half inches of water column. This air handler, uh, you know, the return side of this thing is going to have a pressure difference, <clears throat> a static pressure that is 
that exceeds that. Um, so how could you potentially integrate this, your ventilator into, into your heating and cooling duct work? We um, see this quite a bit. Uh, so what's happening here is the, um, the fresh air from outside is being ducted into the return side of the heating and cooling ductwork, while the exhaust air, the stale indoor air, is being exhausted through a separate duct run. So sometimes called a hybrid approach to um, having your your ERV and sort of um, you know hooking it up to this to your heating and cooling ductwork. Um, this can be a good way to go. Um, you still need the air handler for supply distribution. That's kind of the downside of this one. Um, so in other words, your fresh outside air is coming in. Uh, this was kind of the example that I said earlier. Uh, this is it, it to a T. This is what this was that actual example. So when the air handler is not running, you know, the return side of your heating and cooling ductwork is extremely well ventilated. Um, you know, this outside air is just going to follow the path of least resistance, usually falling out the return side of your system, or it's going to fall, you know, be piped into like, you know, your air handler and it's, it's just going to sit there. It's going to, you know, leak out through, through the air handler and into your mechanical closet or something, right? Um, more often we see it <coughs> going out the, the return side. But um, you know that's not distributing it to the house. It's not really distributing it where it needs to go. It will only distribute it when the air handler is actually running. So, um, in terms of ERV world and what your options are for passive house, um, we talk about with our project teams the difference between a unitized ERV and a central ERV. A unitized ERV is one of these, you know, <clears throat> small sort of uh, enough air for a single family home or a multifamily apartment unit. Um, it's usually a small fixed plate ERV. Usually it's providing exhaust and ventilation to a single apartment. Um, they don't usually contain any mechanical heating or cooling components, except for the case that we talked about with the CERV or the Minotaire system. And these can potentially be <clears throat> kind of like simpler systems. So in terms of trying to make a decision for a multifamily building, whether you're going to go with a central system, a large centrally located ERV, you know, usually on the roof, or sort of many, many, many multiple individual ERVs, you know, these are the considerations that we're wanting to sort of talk about. Um, the biggest downside with this is there's a lot more filters to change. <clears throat> there's a lot more envelope penetrations to mitigate. With the central ERV, these things are mitigated. You only have, you know, a couple of filters to change on one or two, three pieces of equipment at most, right? Um, they usually do have the enthalpy reel, um, you know, they're all in one spot up on the roof. The downside with these, they're way more complex usually. Uh, the equipment, you know, at its core is still doing the same thing. It's still transferring the um, heat and, um, and cooling, right? You still have that energy transfer. Um, but the controls to get this to work are usually a little more sophisticated. Um, and then of course the distribution of this heated, of this uh, ventilation air throughout the building, um, you know, the ducts, the amount of ducting that it takes to do this is large. And so there's a lot of room for duct leakage to happen <clears throat> because these, you know, it's being ducted all throughout a multifamily building. And so um, even small amounts of duct leakage could, you know, sort of lead you not to get to those passive house levels of um, you know, how much air, how much air we can measure being delivered and exhausted out of an individual apartment. So duct leakage becomes a big concern. 
All right, so we have now finally made it to our five minute break, um, which we've already taken. And so we're gonna move right on into sort of like implementing this stuff. Scott, there um, was one question that came in. Mm -hmm. um, the question is, how do you test the flow rate commission of a supply only fresh air ventilation? Yeah. So for the supply only fresh air ventilation, I just want to get to a picture here where we have <clears throat> the duct. Um, sometimes you can make that measurement from the outside. Um, so with, uh, here we go. So if this supply, if this outside air duct is, you know, it's on the outside of the house or building or whatever, and you can get a flow hood over top of it, you can measure from the outside. Um, if it's really windy outside, that might not be the most accurate way to do it, but you know, in theory, you could do it. Also, <clears throat> I've been on the side of buildings, right, where there's siding or like if there's a brick ledge or something, like you know, you can't get your tool to sort of lay flat across here. It's a problem. Another option would be to do an induct measurement um, using some kind of traverse or a pressure probe or something like that to measure the airflow um, that's happening like within the duct itself. Um, so you need another piece of equipment to do that, but it's a possibility to do it. Um, right, so how do we implement this stuff? Um, these are the things that <clears throat> sort of go into it. Plan the duct runs, where is the intake and the exhaust gonna happen? Make the equipment accessible for maintenance. Uh, the ventilator is going to, at a minimum, need to be have the filters changed. Usually on these ERVs and HRVs, um, every three months, um, really the filter should be cleaned or changed. Um, the manufacturer's suggested uh, maintenance interval is going to change. I've seen you know six months up to a year, um, but like in practice, these you know there's a lot of air usually being you know moved through these pieces of equipment and it's happening 24 seven. Um, you know, outdoor air or yeah, outdoor air can be dirty. Um, you know, there's a lot of stuff in it. Not only do the filters of the machine itself need to be changed, but you've also got to take a look at your outside air intake ports. Um, a lot of lint and just, you know, stuff from the ambient air can get stuck as it's brought in and try to brought being brought in through the system because usually there we want a, a mesh you know a, a pretty a pretty wide mesh to keep any rodents or you know birds or anything from getting into that ventilation ductwork but either way there's some maintenance stuff that needs to go on <clears throat> um, Selecting the right box, the ERV or HRV, determine the integration, is it gonna be a standalone strategy, and then commission it. These are the tools to success. Um, so for equipment, uh, how to select stuff. Um, for passive house, this ener the energy recovery's gotta be at least 75%. Um, the supply for the design temperature, you want that to be greater than 62 degrees Fahrenheit uh, for a design day in the winter. So this means you might need a duct heater depending on how efficient the piece of, uh, how efficient your uh, ventilator is. You want to look at, well, how cold could it possibly get for where I'm installing this thing? And am I going to be able to maintain a fresh air supply into the building, into your apartment or house of greater than 62 degrees when it is, you know, the coldest winter day that you are expecting to get? If the answer is no, it's not going to be able to do that, then you might need to look at a, a duct heater. Um, and that would be sort of a supplementary piece of equipment that's gonna sit on um, usually between the outside air intake and the ventilator itself to sort of bring the, that temperature of the air up on these very cold days, very cold nights. 
other considerations, the power consumption. So not only the efficiency of the recovery, um, but also how much power it's going to use, how much electrical energy it's going to use to move that um, air around. And so usually we're looking for something at like 30 to 50 watts <clears throat> when moving 100 to 150 CFM of air. So that is a fan power efficiency of 0.765 watts per CFM. And then the static pressure capability is going to depend on the, um, like for the, for the system, for this box, you know, for your ERV, HRV, um, what, are, what are those engineering specs? What is the static pressure um, that, you know, it can deal with? And this is gonna be driven by your duct design. And then we also want to look for this MERV 13 filtration on the on the incoming air. So usually costing for something like this for a unitized system with these specs, we've seen you know 800 to 1,000 dollars per box. What about the operating cost? Here is sort of a pretty generalized. Sorry, not generalized. A very specific example <clears throat> for an 1,800 square foot three bedroom home in Albany. Uh, actually, it probably wasn't a home. I think it was a dwelling unit. It was an apartment. Um, and at 90 CFM continuously, uh, which would be the amount required by 62 to 2019, this is um, what the operating costs were by um, the different types of ventilation systems that you could do. So as you can see, the cost to run the fan, the electrical energy required to run an exhaust only fan um, was pretty low, but you know there's no heat recovery. And so the additional heat needed to warm that um, in order to condition that outside air brought it up to, let's say $210 for an annual cost. For that central fan integrated system, because in this example it was using the actual air handler fan, you can see it's quite high, the electrical energy, and then of course the additional heat to do um, to do this system is pretty close to the exhaust only system, if not exactly equal, right? You still have to condition that um, ventilation air with your heating and cooling equipment. With an HRV, you can see it's the lowest one of both, right? For both the fan and then the additional heat because there is energy recovery, because there is heat recovery in this example. Um, the cost of doing the, uh, the cost of moving the fan, moving the air um, is greater than the exhaust only example, but you make up for um, any additional costs from the exhaust when you compare the HRV that additional heat because there is energy transfer is reduced. And then if you use an HRV with the air handler, um, I'm not sure why there's additional heat that's needed there. Huh. This wasn't my example, but of course the fan energy because you have now both the air handler and the HRV <coughs> incorporated into you know, your ventilation system, the uh, the electrical energy can be quite high. And then um, the additional heat here is, I don't know why it's quite so much higher than the HRV. It must be that um, it's maybe not a balanced system at this, at this stage, right? You're bringing in more outside air um, than you're exhausting. That's, that's what we'll say uh, as to why that is showing a higher cost. Um, here we talked, we talked a little bit about the pros and cons of this unitized versus centralized, <clears throat> just at a high level, but um, here's some other considerations to think about. Um, for the unitized pros, uh, it can be on that residence electric meter. So, um, you know, the owner uh, might not be paying for the cost of ventilation <clears throat> per se, because it is, you know, a unitized Ventilator could be wired to the residence uh, electric meter. It does have pretty simple controls. And then the cons, you know, again, this filter change, we, you know, two to three times annually, if not say four times annually in every unit. 
Uh, you've got that regular exterior vent cleaning that we talked about, and of course, two envelope penetrations per apartment, right? Um, you, you've got to be able to vent this thing um, to the outside, so that those number of penetrations can add up quickly. And then these centralized, so the big fan on the roof, the big RV, ERV on the roof, it's very accessible for maintenance. You don't have to <clears throat> get into anybody's apartment. Um, and it's only got a couple of envelope penetrations. And then of course, the centralized cons, it takes up space for all of these large vertical risers. Um, it's gotta be fire rated and very well sealed, the risers and um, all the duct work. And then the controls can be quite a bit more complicated as well. Um, so decom decoupling, decoupling the ventilation from <coughs> space conditioning. So we talked about um, the option to integrate your ventilation system, i.e. your ERV or HRV into the heating and cooling system. Um, but decoupling is going to allow for a smaller capacity for the heating and cooling equipment since that ventilation air is preconditioned using the exhaust air of the ERV, right? It's not, um, there's no, the heating and cooling ductwork, the heating and cooling equipment is not being uh, used quite as much. The ventilation system can completely turn off during unoccupied periods. So, you know, when your ventilation system is not tied to your air handler of, um, for the heating and cooling, um, and you wouldn't have to run that air handler to sort of distribute the air. So these changes increase efficiency and greatly simplify the controls when you sort of decouple the, this ventilation system from the heating and cooling system. Wanted to talk about uh, flow rate control. So there's these kinds of dampers called car dampers, constant airflow regulator dampers. They work great on constant airflow systems uh, because it is, it uses sort of a bladder technology. It uses a blade technology that um, can sometimes be set at the factory at the specified uh, flow rate. So let's say you wanna achieve that 20 CFM of exhaust air out of a bathroom, you can buy a car damper that is set to 20 CFM. Um, <clears throat> as long as you achieve the static pressures that are required uh, within the duct system, you're going to get very close to that 20 CFM. Um, some models have an adjustable airflow setting, which um, we highly recommend. Sometimes, um, you know, slight small adjustments are needed in the field. Even though these are constant airflow regulators, sometimes uh, they are required to get these fine-tuned small adjustments in the field to hit the passive house spec. Um, but yeah, they uh, they work great. All right, so we talked about like controls being kind of a problem, or um, not a problem, but they can be a concern on some of these larger systems. Um, so considerations for controls for uh, unitized systems, sometimes they don't have adjustable fans, they don't have adjustable speed uh, on the actual fans themselves. And so you have to damper them down with a, a damper like a, like a car damper. <clears throat> systems with adjustable fan speed controls um, have to be set up properly. And of course, testing, adjusting, and balancing is always a crucial part of any, um, any system, especially ventilation systems. Um, and duct sealing, duct sealing, duct sealing has gotta be, it's gotta happen in order to get to these, uh, to the flow rates that you're hoping for and that the system has been designed to. Um, in terms of sizing these things, um, the equipment sizes sometimes could be reduced. Um, 
reducing the first cost and improving efficiency and controllability. So this is an example of a pretty large system versus the smaller system. And you can see the flow ranges. Um, it's, you know, 750 to 3000 CFM um, for the, the system up top versus the 75 to 1000 CFM system. So, <clears throat> um, you want to carefully review the ventilation rates so that you match the expected occupancy and the space use types. Um, we're going to move on to filtration. Um, these last couple of slides are the last couple of slides we've got for the for the talk, and we're coming up on uh, you know getting close to that time. But we wanted to talk a little bit about filtration. Um, So while filtration is not necessarily <clears throat> part of um, every ventilation system, right? Um, like an exhaust only system, you're not gonna get filtered air. A supply system, a supply only system, you might. There's some products out there that <clears throat> that supply air is gonna move through a filter uh, before it sort of enters the space. But on almost all ERVs and HRVs, there is uh, filtration. And so I uh, wanted to talk about filtration a little bit. So um, here's sort of like an example, taking like COVID, for example, right? The size of that particle compared to a individual bacteria, compared to your red blood cell. And then these are particulate matters that are um, 2.5 microns. And then this is a particulate matter that is 10 microns. And so you can see that um, you know the very small COVID virus um, particle is you know way smaller than even these very small things, and so that MERV thirteen rated that MERV thirteen rating for a filter is uh, kind of needed. Um, you can see down here in terms of the particle size efficiency, these MERV 13s and MERV 14s um, basically saying, you know, are needed to get these um, pretty small, pretty small size particles. Um, <clears throat> in terms of designing, this is kind of a, a dated slide at this point, but um, we're basically saying that, yeah, MERV 13, or higher are efficient at cap capturing airborne viruses, but a MERV-14 is gonna do a better job. Um, in terms of just filter types, you wanna skip these kinds of filters. Um, these filters usually are gonna catch the big stuff, but it's not gonna catch, you know, small or even, you know, semi, kind of even, you know, larger pieces. Um, this is more used to protect equipment from <clears throat> dust and debris, not so much. Um, they don't do a great job of actually filtering the air. What you want to look for is a pleated filter. Um, these different kinds of pleated filters can come in charged or uncharged. Um, so a charged or electrolyte electrolyte filter, um, you can have a lower pressure drop. If it is an uncharged filter, you have a higher pressure drop. So uh, as the air moves across the filter, <clears throat> that pressure is going to drop more in the uncharged uh, filter than the charged one. And so both of these, the, um, the pressure drop is going to increase a little bit over time for the charged version, but not as much as the uncharged one. So as the filter sort of gets dirtier and dirtier, that pressure drop increases. So it's important to replace and to really keep up with the removal of them. Um, for the uncharged one, that pressure drop is really going to great is going to increase greatly as the filter gets loaded up. Um, what are some ways to <clears throat> sort of just reduce pressure or drop in general? Uh, the pleats, the ruffles, um, you know, there's much more surface area on pleats, especially the dense, deep pleats. 
And so looking at these uh, thicker, the, the bigger filters, right? Um, the thickness does matter. And so one inch, two inch, and four inch is shown here. Um, you can get MERV 13 in sort of the standard uh, one inch filter, but a thicker filter with that MERV 13 rating is going to have a lower pressure drop. There's just more surface area um, for that air to sort of move across and um, you're gonna reduce that pressure, that pressure drop. Uh, why do we filter? Well, not only are we filtering to um, have a healthy indoor air quality, but it's also to protect <clears throat> the equipment. Um, MERV-8 is sort of like the minimum to, to protect um, equipment. So this is the actual um, coil, the actual um, you know, piece of equipment, piece of air handling equipment where, you know, if it's getting dirty, it's going to damage it. Um, you know, this foot, this picture on the on the left, as opposed to the clean um, coil on the right, the clean one is going to last much longer, have a more efficient heat transfer across it, and just give you more life out of the equipment. And then the last thing to say is about bypass. Bypass refers to air uh, moving around a filter instead of through it. You can see that this engineered airtight filter rack um, is a great way to go because the filter is filling this entire um, air, well, not in this image. In this image, there is significant bypass around it, right? You can, you can see um, without the, without the door, without the cover installed, like if you just let this thing without the cover installed work, um, you know, a lot of air is going to be brought around the filter. It's not going to work all that well. When you add the door with the weather stripping and everything, you don't have air move past or around the filter, i.e. the filter is not bypassed. So that is it. Um, wondering if anybody wants to share any final thoughts, if there are any questions that hadn't been picked up yet, now's the time to, to ask them. Um, but yeah, that's the end of the, end of the talk for the, for today. We have another, uh, portion of this, uh, seminar where we're going to talk a little bit more about, um, the high efficiency portion of, um, of doing this ventilation. We talked a lot today about kind of the, um, you know, the basics of airflow, 62.2, the different examples, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, next time we'll talk more about like the commissioning stuff, the installation details, the things that we see go wrong, um, and less about, um, you know, the theory and the flow rate and the design and that sort of thing. Um, so thanks. Um, yeah, thanks, Scott. Anything. Doesn't doesn't look like there's any other questions, um, but just a, a reminder to everyone uh, that the um, link to the recording will be sent out uh, to all attendees with a uh, as part of the post um, tr uh, webinar survey, um, and uh, that'll be instructions uh, there as well for uh, AI8 and VPI CEUs for those interested in that. So. Um, thanks again to the sponsors of Energize Connecticut for today's presentation, and thank, thanks to you, Scott. We'll see you next Monday for part Sounds two. Sounds good. Yeah, thanks, everybody. Thanks. Bye. Thanks, Anna. Bye. Bye. Bye.